that's the last time you're going to see that. I know, you're not happy anymore now. So uh, we're at the end of our series on being happy, according to the Beatitudes. Um, now, some of you said, hey, how come you don't post that online? We want to say it online, we want to share with our friends. Well, when Pharrell sees that he's not going to be happy, and, <laughs> and he's going to sue us, too. So, uh, so we're just, we're just going to have to remember it, let it burn into our minds. Some images there you won't be able to forget, like my dancing. But uh, that's the best way. We're, we're just so glad that you enjoyed it during all this time. As you can see, Chuck's not here. Uh, we are talking about persecutions. I think Chuck was persecuted by that video. And he just said, I can't take it anymore. And so, uh, so he's not here this week. But we're going to talk about the last stage of happiness when Jesus went through the eight different things and what we call the Beatitudes. And he ends on a real doozy. Blessed are you when you're persecuted. Wow. Really? I mean, that's just about like the worst thing that you can imagine, being attacked for your faith. And he's saying that you can just go on and be happy with it. You know, it's almost saying that no matter what you're going through, think about the worst possible thing you've been going through, persecution being one of them, but many other things, and you can still be happy. And he's going to show us how to do that. Now, persecution at that time when Jesus was talking wasn't as great. You know, the message wasn't getting out as much, and they, the, 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 the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and all them, they're just starting to hear his message, so there wasn't a lot of persecution, but he knew exactly what was going to be happening within at least three years of the time he gives this message. And of course, the persecution is very real all the way to today. In fact, if you see the news, you see things like in Nigeria, where 6,000 Christians, mostly women and children, have been murdered because of their faith in Christ. It's done by a group called Fulani Radicals. I had no idea there was a group such as this. Um, they're nomads. They live in that area. They're predominantly Muslim, and they've been killing the Christians there. You're seeing in all kinds of other areas. Turkey, right now it's in the news, big news. There's an American a pastor there in Turkey, Andrew Brunson, who uh, has been charged with terrorism, and his terrorism is he was spreading the gospel. And so they have all these charges against him. They put him in prison. Now, they just released him and put him under house arrest. Not quite sure what a house arrest looks like in Turkey. But thank God for our administration right now that is going face-to-face -face with the Turkish government. Our president, our vice president, a very direct message to the people in Turkey, to the, uh, the president of Turkey, saying, you need to release this guy now. In fact, just about an hour ago, I got a tweet that the Turkish president responded and said, we're not going to be bullied over this. So it's happening. It's very real. North Korea, who we're trying to establish relationships with, well, we have to also know that they are number one for 14 years in a row when it comes to religious persecution. I'd like to see an end to it there. But it's happening not just in these big countries that you probably know. It's happening in some of these smaller countries that if I said it to you, you'd say, oh, where is that? Because I did too. I had to go look it up to be absolutely sure. Mali, M-A-L-I, it's in West Africa. The persecution there has been growing. In fact, there's a list of the countries where the most persecution happens. And they were like at 44, and they skyrocketed to like 35 or, or 32. That's what it was, 32. And so there, the, 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 the fastest growing persecution is happening in that country. And, and not only is it just, uh, just groups like Muslims that are attacking Christians and killing them, but you're also seeing the government is beginning to put restrictions on Christians. And some of these restrictions that are happening, in fact, the Pew Research that was looking into it said 25% of the countries out of 198 were either at high or very high levels. It now just moved to 27%, and it affects 215 million Christians. In addition, the social hostilities towards religions is at 27% of these 198 nations. That's high and very high levels. Who's behind all this? When well, 35 out of the 50 countries, it's Islamic extremists. So this is very real today. 
And once again, thankful for people like the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, who got together just this week, 80 nations, to talk about international uh, uh, religious persecution that's happening. And they all got together to try to think of ways in order to stop it in their own countries and to influence, use their power to stop it in other countries. So it is happening here. Now remember what Jesus said. Blessed are those who persecute, those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Really. We're going to be persecuted and we're going to be happy. Well, how can we get to that place where the apostles were at? And they were persecuted in the book of Acts. In fact, very early on in the book of Acts, they were drugged before a group called the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin were the uh, Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, and all those people from the uh, Jewish faith. And so they were dragging them in front of them and saying, why are you saying these things? Stop doing it. And they whipped them. They imprisoned them. They said all kinds of things. And they said, now get out of here and don't say anything to anyone about what you believe. And in Acts 5, it says this, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name, the name being the name of Jesus Christ. Wow. Rejoicing because they were worthy of disgrace. Now, did they go and shut themselves back up in the upper room like they did after Jesus died? No. Verse 42, day after day. That means every day. They were in the temple courts and from house to house. They didn't pick some quiet, out-of-the-way place. They went right to the temple courts. So guess who else is in the temple courts? The Sanhedrin. So they're like, whatever. We're going right back and doing what we were doing before. And they were going house to house, knocking on people's door, telling them about Jesus Christ. It says they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. How can we get to that place? I mean, we don't suffer the kind of persecution that they suffered back then, but we can still be bold about our faith like they are. We have, for right now, the freedom to do so in this country. Why aren't we out there like them? Worthy of counting ourselves worthy for suffering disgrace. What stops us day after day to never stop proclaiming and teaching? So I'm going to give you three don'ts that you need to do uh, when you're persecuted and, and just really just to stand up for your faith in these days. The first one is this. Don't be surprised when you're challenged. Now that's going to occur. Guarantee it's going to occur to you in some way. Let's go back to when Jesus, in Matthew 5, where Jesus is talking about persecution, it's verse 10. He says this, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. So let's just look at that for a second. What is causing the persecution? It's righteousness. It's that we, as Christians in this world, are living in a right way with God. That, are, that we're living according to Scripture, that we're living according to the ways that Jesus has taught us. We're following the commandments in those, and so we're living in a right way. It's not a self-righteous way where we're determining how we should live. It's exactly according to what the Bible says. So the persecution becomes of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is there. So if you're doing this, if you're getting persecuted wherever you're at, in work, at school, in your neighborhood, with your family, with your friends, and it's because of your righteousness, the kingdom of heaven is all yours. You're part of that. You are blessed, that means be happy, when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Now, those kind of things happen everywhere. And people, if people find out that you're a Christian, oh boy, it's going to happen. But Jesus is saying, blessed. Be happy because of it. Look how this goes on. Go to the next verse. Be glad and rejoice, because your reward is great in heaven. If you're looking for a reward here, it's, just, it's not going to happen. It's not, very, it's not a very good reward for you to be a Christian on this earth today. But the reward is great in heaven, for that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Well, who were those prophets? Who were the ones before us, the ones that were getting persecuted? All kinds of them. Moses, for example, had to go up against 
uh, the guy that was in charge of the, the most powerful nation, the Pharaoh, and he said to him, let my people go. And Pharaoh's going, I got a million of you who are his slaves. I don't want you to leave. And as he got resistance and persecution, remember they caused him to make more bricks and to do it in a faster time and all that kind of stuff? God increased the persecution until they were released. That's one example. Another one, Daniel. You know, there are all kinds of rules that were being set up to worship idols, to pray to the king, and all this kind of things. And Daniel and his friends said, no, we're not going to do that. So they were persecuted because of it, either thrown into a fire or thrown into a lion's den. But what did God do? Saved them out of all of those things. Jeremiah is one of the major prophets uh, in your Bible. He was speaking to his own people at a time when God's judgment was going to happen to Jerusalem and to Judah in that area. And Jeremiah was speaking up saying, guys, we've got to get our act together or it's, it's going to be bad for us. And the religious leaders went, we don't want to hear from you. They punched him in the face. They threw him in a cistern, which is a hole for water, big hole in the ground. They just threw him inside of it. This is the kind of person that the ancient prophets had. Why do we think it's going to be any different for us? It's not going to be. What is our persecution? Facebook. Oh, oh, I put a verse on, and people didn't like it, and people attacked me for my faith. Or someone unfriended me. Wow. Andrew Brunson in Turkey would sure love to have people just not like his Facebook post instead of being in prison for two years. Let's get some perspective here on things. Yes, if you're, if you're putting out things that are just how you believe and you're saying it in a, in a nice way and people don't want to be your friends, that's the way it's going to be. If you're being a jerk about your faith, I would hope they would un unfriend you. I might unfriend you. So it's really our, per our righteousness... As, as they talked about in that verse, it's our righteousness, it's our right way of living that is making people upset. It shouldn't be because of our anger that is making them upset. And right after this, in verse, uh, verse 12 of Matthew 5, right after that, verse 13, the next thing that Jesus talks about, he's saying, now this is the way you're supposed to live your life. And he talks about salt, and he talks about light. Next thing, right after this. So it must be important. So what he's saying is, that when you're out in the world and you're living righteously, you need to live in such a way that is active. And that activity comes through being salt and being light. When you're salt, they used salt at that time to preserve some of their foods. They didn't have refrigeration, so they stayed around a little bit longer, so they sprinkled salt on them. That was a preserving agent. What is it that we're supposed to preserve? Goodness and righteousness in this world. We're supposed to preserve our godly heritage. These are all the kinds of things that we're supposed to preserve and keep in place and not allow them to deteriorate. Light. We're supposed to be light too. I remember my dorm room when I used to wake up in the morning and flick on the light. All the cockroaches went Psh! in all directions. Cockroaches don't like light. Well, people don't like light either. They don't like the areas of their light, life exposed. But we have to constantly be revealing those areas where there is lies we have to show it. But, but again, it's not because of our anger. It's because that's the way we live. When Jesus described the church, he used the word ecclesia. It's a Greek word. The word means called out ones. So we're called out of this world. We're supposed to be in the world. Yes, can't avoid that. But we don't have to be of the world. That's our choice. And so as we're called out of this world, whether it's at school, whether it's at... Uh, your, your neighborhood or at work, you are supposed to be different than the people around you. I remember this very clearly about, it was six years ago. I was called out, I went out to California to work on a TV show, the American Bible Challenge. And I was the Bible expert on the show. <laughs> I know, you're thinking, how good could that show be? <laughs> but apparently there wasn't anyone in Hollywood that worked on TV shows before and knew the Bible. They couldn't find one. And so they had to come all the way to Orlando, Florida to find me, and God set it up. It was amazing. So I worked on that show. I was also the only one really on the show that was the, well, you would call him the fundamentalist, born-again, evangelical Baptist pastor, right? So I had a very specific place on that show to make sure the show stayed biblically correct. But a lot of the people on the show were not Christians, 
They were just good at what they did to make a quality show, and that's what it was about. Excellence honors God. And so they were all helping to be a part of that. But my views on a lot of things were very different from the people that were there. I used to live in Southern California, so I understood it. Uh, but being put into that, that area at this certain time proved to be challenging because when I was out there, I remember we were all sitting in the room. There was about 12 of us sitting around, and all of a sudden the discussion came up about Chick-fil-A. The whole thing had just exploded when Dan Cathy said, oh, we, uh, we believe as in our leadership that the traditional marriage is between a man and a woman. That's basically all he said. How did the media interpret it? Chick-fil-A hates gays. So that was the discussion in the room. Did you hear what he said? I hadn't really heard about it. Uh, did you hear what he said? Oh, yeah. Oh, that was terrible. Yeah, Chick-fil-A hates gay. Well, I'm never going to eat a Chick-fil-A again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they all turned to me, and they go, what do you think? And I'm like, hey, I want to come out here and be friends with everyone, right? I want to be a positive example, and now you're putting my faith on the line. And then one girl who was the researcher on the show would actually research the questions to make sure they were correct, um, said to me, yeah, I'm a lesbian, which I didn't know. I'm a lesbian. What do you think about that? <laughs> so, you know, I just took a second, and I just said, you know what? God loves everybody. I know that. That's pretty clear from the Bible. God loves everyone, but... What he says about marriage and our sexual activity is very clear in the Bible. Then I said in the nicest way I could, I said, well, you're the researcher on the show. Why don't you go research the Bible? It's right there. It's very clear. And now I was super nice to her. I mean, she got extra super nice the rest of that show. And I wanted to make sure that I had no condemnation of her. It's not my job to condemn her. But you're going to be faced with these sort of challenges. The entire room turning to you and saying, oh, you're the Christian. How do you respond to something like this? Well, let's help you in that area. Let's look at the second don't. The second don't is... Don't, oops, I missed it. Gosh, it worked so well in all the other services. I don't know why it didn't work here. There it is. Don't react, respond gracefully. Don't react, but respond gracefully. Now, this is a great verse to tell, teach you how to respond to people uh, instead of reacting, because at first we want to react and fight. People come at us with a fight. What do we want to do? We want to fight right back. Well, that's not the case. So look at what he says in 1 Peter. He starts off and he says it this way. Who then will harm you if you are devoted to what is good? That's the first thing we need to know. We really can't be hurt in this fight. They are not going to hurt us. May we lose our job. May we lose our friendship. Yeah, yeah, some of those things may happen. But real hurt? I mean, even if we die, we get heaven. So they really can't hurt us. It may, it may sting a little and everything, but we got to know that they really can't hurt us. But even if you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. So even if our right way of living causes suffering, hey, we're still blessed. He goes on with this in the next verse. Do not fear what they fear. Be intimidated. Now, that's interesting because we've got to understand the mentality of the people that are attacking. They have their own fears. There are things that they're afraid of. What is it that they're afraid of? Well, they're afraid of things like not fitting in, not being accepted, not being liked, right? Sometimes it's being told that they can't do the things they enjoy doing, their preferences or whatever. And so that's some of their fears. That's why they're reacting this way. That's not why we're reacting. I mean, we're not here to be liked. We're here to be called out. So he says, but in your hearts regard Christ as Lord as holy, ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. So, we have to be ready to defend, not angrily, not bitterly, but just defend to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope. So, what it's saying is you should have a reason for hope inside of you. Do you have hope inside of you? Do other people see that hope and want to know why it is that you have hope when it seems that everything else around us in this world and everything we see seems hopeless. Do they see that you have hope in you? 
So get ready to give it a reason for it. Do you? Do you know how to answer a lot of these questions and attacks that come at you? You need to be ready. Now he's going to tell you how to do it. Next verse. Yet, do this with gentleness and respect. That is so key right there. Gentle, right? Be nice with it. Be kind. Don't just don't start gritting your teeth, right? Do it with a smile, right? There's nothing for you to fear. They're not going to really harm you. Gentleness. Respect. Respect them for who they are, what position they play in this world. They may be your boss. They may be a family member. They're simply just a person that God loves. Respect them for that. Keeping a clear conscience so that you don't walk away later and go, oh, why did I say that? I'm such a jerk. I shouldn't have said those things. Make sure that you don't walk away and beat yourself up for the way you handled that. Get yourself under control and answer them with gentleness and respect. So that when you are accused, those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. So they dig up things, they're trying to look for things like posts and angry things that you've done before that they can't go, see? See what kind of person you are? He's going, no, 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 we gotta, we gotta clean that record up and make sure they can't come back to us and get us for something that we've done before. For it is better to suffer for doing good than it should, uh, if that should be God's will, then for doing evil. That's the best way of doing it, right there. With gentleness and with respect. Now, when you think about the way people attack, part of you are probably thinking, oh, what about uh, the eye for the eye, right? Shouldn't we be fighting back? I mean, eye for an eye, if they, have, if they throw an insult at me, should I throw an insult back at them? Eye for an eye also appears in this, the Beatitudes, chapter 5. It appears in that same chapter. But what Jesus is talking about there is this, justice. We should live in a society that has justice. So there's an equal consequ consequence for an action. And it should be across the board always the same. So if you do something bad here and you get more punishment for it, that's not right. If you get less punishment for it, that's not right either. It should be equal to what it is. But Jesus is saying in your own lives, you need to live in such a way that is graceful, of showing grace to people. And so then he goes on right after that to talk about it when he talks about when somebody slaps you in the cheek, give them the other cheek. Someone takes your coat, give them your shirt. Someone says, hey, go another mile with me. You say, you know, go a mile with me. You say, I'll go another mile with you. That's showing grace. That's showing gentleness and respect and all those things that we need to show. He finishes that particular section. He's talking about loving your enemies. So if there's somebody out there that's antagonistic to you, love them. He says, pray for them. And then he ends that chapter with, with verse 48 and says, be perfect. Therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. So we need to answer them and respond in a perfect way that honors, that honors Christ, that we're living righteously we're doing it gently with a clean conscience at all times. This is the best way to face up against persecution. The world says, fight back. That's why they pick the fights. But God says, love back. Love them right back. That's how you can do it with a clear conscience. Now, you also see what the apostles do, and they do, they do some amazing things. The persecution that they face in chapter 13... Paul and Barnabas go into this one area, and they get all kinds of persecution that happens to them. They stir up everything, and it says in, in 13, the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men in the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. So they shook the dust off their feet as a warning to them and went to Iconium, and they were filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. So sometimes when you're attacked, shake it off. To shake it off and move on. That's the best thing. But you know what? That's not the only response the apostles had. In fact, in the next chapter, 14, it said the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul. That's real persecution right there. And dragged him outside the city thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and he went back into the city. Sometimes you shake it off. Sometimes you got to jump right back in. 
you know what, that may be someone very close to you. Just because you're getting persecuted at work, shouldn't you say, well, I need to quit? No, sometimes you need to jump right back in. Show them that you have perseverance. Show them that you have faith. Show them that whatever it is they throw at you isn't going to hurt you, that you can take it. The last don't that we need to do is don't forget. You're actually winning in momentary loss. You know, if you like sports and some of those great games that you remember, or those, uh, but every sports movie is going to have some sort of dramatic finish where it looks like one team is going to lose, but then they pull it off. If you remember the 1995 NBA Eastern Finals, Reggie Miller, eight points in nine seconds. It's a documentary about it. It's so amazing. Think about that in the NBA, eight points in nine seconds. It's those kind of come-behind victories that happen, where the horse seems like he's four lengths back. There's no way he's going to win the Preakness. Next thing you know, he's crossing the finish line. That's the way Christianity is. It looks like we're behind and we're not going to win. But guess what? The end has already been determined. And we're already going to win. In fact, the apostles that were sitting there watching Jesus on the cross had that feeling. Oh, we're doomed. We have lost. Jesus is dying right now on the cross. He is bleeding out in front of us. I guess this is it. Three days later, wasn't it? Three days later, it was, it was on. And in fact, the victory had been proclaimed because he rose again from the dead. Stephen, when he was stoned because of his faith in Acts 7, it looked bad. All the people are like, wait a minute. Now us regular people are getting killed here in Jerusalem? Us regular believers are experiencing death like Jesus did? So they ran. And they went to all parts of of Judah. They went to all parts of uh, Samaria. They just moved out everywhere they could, and they took their faith with them. And they spread the gospel to all those other areas because of the persecution and stoning of Stephen. It looked bad, but it actually was a great thing. So many times we're going to look at some of these news things that are happening in our own lives. We're going to go, oh no, we're losing. It's momentary. There are momentary setbacks, but the victory has already been established. The victory is through Jesus Christ. Now, there's a verse that Jesus said I find very troubling, but it motivates me. That as we're attacked, there's times that we can be ashamed of Christ. We can be ashamed of what we believe. We be ashamed that we go to church. And this is what Jesus says in Mark 8, 38. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Now, I'm reading this, and I'm, I'm just trying to figure out who exactly is he talking to? Because he's talking to those who are in this adulterous and sinful generation. So is he talking about people who are, are adulterous and sinful in the generation? Or is he talking about believers who live in this adulterous and sinful generation? Because the ones who are in the adulterous and sinful generation aren't being ashamed of Christ. They're just flat out rejecting him. It would seem to me that it would be the believers who would be ashamed and going, oh, uh, Jesus, yeah, mm, yeah, I heard about him. Why? That would be shame. And what it's saying is that when he comes back, that he would be ashamed of those people. I'm still processing this, but I'm trying to figure out what is that? Am I going to have to see that disappointed look on Jesus' face that I never wanted to see from my father because I misbehaved that looked at me and just went, right? You know that look. You hated it. According to that verse, could I get that look from Jesus? Really? After all I did, here you are now in the kingdom of heaven. You're in, you're in heaven now for eternity, and you were ashamed of me on earth? Look, I don't completely understand if that's the case, but here's all I know. I just better not be ashamed right now. I'm just going to live a life that's not ashamed. That's going to be very bold. I'm not going to cower back. What can anyone do to me? What can anyone really do to you? And we need more Christians like that in the world whether there's outright persecution happening or there's subtle persecution happening, whatever it is, we need to stand up and be more bold to experience true happiness. Philippians, it says this 
in verse 21. For me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. That's where we try, we really find true gain in our life. But we have to ask ourselves this question. What is the highest gain in your life? What do you put up there and say, that is the absolute best thing that I need to make my life the most fulfilling and the most happy? Is it job? Is it that relationship? Or do you want to see that look from Jesus, that approving, thankful look, because you stood up at times when others were attacking you? Is that the highest gain for you? Are you doing anything that's worthy of persecution? You have to ask yourself for that. Not that you're out there being a jerk about your faith. We don't need more Christian jerks. We really don't. We just need more people that are bold and kind and gentle about what they believe. Thoughtful, too. Are you doing any good work? Does anybody around you know where you are today? Or are you keeping that quiet because you're ashamed of what that may mean that they think about you? Questions to ask yourself. I want to end us on a prayer. And I'm going to tell you this prayer is coming from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 18. It wasn't written as a prayer, but I took the words and I modified it in such a way that we could make it a prayer. So as I say these words, I want you to pray them. But this is really talking about how, we, how our hearts need to be in times of trouble, in times of persecution, and saying that we are not people that's ever going to back, back off or be ashamed of what we believe. So I'm going to use this as our closing. So if you could stand right now. If you could bow your heads and just pray with me right now. Dear God, we are just earthly vessels. But this extraordinary power that we need can only come from you. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry the death of Jesus in our body so that the life of Jesus may also be displayed in our body. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that Jesus' life may also be displayed in our mortal flesh. Death is at work in us, but life is in you, Lord. For we know that the one who raised Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you. Everything is for your benefit so that as grace extends more and more people, it may cause thanksgiving to increase to your glory. We do not give up. Even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. We will not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. For what is unseen is eternal. We pray this in your name. Amen. Now go be the bold church. Bye-bye.